We start this walk in the neighboring town of Duxbury at the Miles Standish Monument State Reservation. Standish was the military leader of Plymouth Colony, who, while having great skill as a soldier, also used brutality that angered natives as well as moderate colonials. Perhaps his lack of total admiration is summed up in Thomas Morton's nickname for Standish, Captain Shrimp. The 116-foot granite memorial with a 14-foot statue of Standish has a panoramic view of Plymouth Harbor. Unfortunately, today we found the memorial closed, but still took the short walk up the hill to see the column. Although in this video I'll refer to the pilgrims, they referred to themselves as saints and were not Puritans who wanted to purify the Church of England, but separatists who hoped to establish a new church in the new world. While I was focused on photographing the monument, Tyro found an irresistible pile of poop somewhere. After an emergency trip to the self-serve dog wash, we were on to Plymouth. Thank you, Pet Supply Plus. This is a statue of Massasoit by Cyrus Dow. Massasoit formed an early alliance with the Plymouth Colony for mutual defense and aided the colony in avoiding starvation through their first years. At the first Thanksgiving, Edward Winslow wrote there, quote, were many the Indians coming amongst us and amongst the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, unquote. Although the pilgrims first landed at what is today Provincetown, and why anyone would step off a boat onto a rock rather than the beach, Plymouth Rock has become an American icon today. That may be mostly down to Felicia Hemans, a 19th century Welsh poet famous in her day, who never visited the United States, yet nevertheless wrote The Landing of the Pilgrims, which popularized the image of Plymouth Rock. The poem includes the somewhat less than immortal lines, the breaking waves dash high on a stern rock-bound coast, and the woods against a stormy sky, their giant branches toast. And the heavy night hung dark, the winds and waters o'er, when a band of exiles moored their bark on the wild New England shore. In August 1620, the Mayflower and Speedwell left Southampton, England, only for the Speedwell to begin to leak almost immediately. Returning to shore, the travelers squeezed themselves and their cargo onto the Mayflower and set off, now late and into the height of the Atlantic storm season. Five passengers died at sea, while another young man, John Howland, who happens to be my direct ancestor, was swept overboard, but managed to grab a rope and be towed back aboard. A further 45 of the 102 Mayflower passengers died in the first winter of 1620 to 1621. It's almost certain that the pilgrims would not have survived without native help. They brought with them sundials, candle snuffers, and a complete history of Turkey, yet they knew almost nothing about farming, fishing, or hunting. Samoset, an Abenaki from the Muscongas Bay region of Maine, walked into the settlement one day, alarming the colonists, but put their fears to rest by asking for beer in English he had learned in England as a captive of the Merchant Tailors Guild. Along with Tisquatam, or Squanto, a member of the Patuxet tribe, who had been captured by an English explorer, sold into slavery in Spain, traveled to England and finally returned to America in 1619 to find his tribe wiped out by epidemic, taught the colonists survival skills including how to fish, plant, and hunt. Follow this gentle stream through Brewster Park to a replica 17th century gristmill.
please subscribe to our channel. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up, and you can always comment below.